subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update. So welcome, Sumanji. I am extremely excited and honored to have you as an esteemed speaker on Nari Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank you so much for inviting me. So Manji, you thank have you. achieved so many milestones, not just as a woman, but as a civilian. You are an inspiration to millions of young women who are looking to break the glass ceiling, just, a, just as you have done. For the benefit of our audiences, Suman Sharma is the world's first woman to co-pilot the mighty Russian MIG-35 fighter jet, cruising at 0.9 max speed and pulling 7G above 20,000 feet. That's extremely impressive, Sumanji. For Thank this you. achievement, she entered the Limca record, Book of Records for being the first woman to enter the MIG-35 cockpit. She is also the first civilian woman to co-pilot sorties of the world's best fighters, like the American F-16 and the Sukhoi 30, and the most recently, the European Eurofighter, Typhoon, which is the world's most advanced fighter aircraft. I'm extremely proud of her, not only as, in, as an Indian, but as an Indian woman, because I too am looking to break the glass ceiling in the fields that I'm working. For all her achievements, Sumanji has, been, has won the Great Women's Achievers Award in 2010, as well as the CMSP Journalist Award in 2013. Currently, Sumanji is working as a defense journalist and writes for an international publication on defense and foreign policy. Sumanji, through your extreme hard work and extensive knowledge, you have achieved what no other civilian woman, not only that, but no other woman in uniform has been able to achieve. And through your achievements, you've broken so many gender barriers. So many women are all often discouraged or demotivated to join any field which has a lot of physical rigor. You know, they're encouraged to join fields which are more gender conforming, the gender roles that have been defined by a society. So how were you able to fight this system? You know, what were some of the challenges that you faced in order to achieve your dreams? Uh, thank you for that brilliant introduction, Sonali. That's really kind of you. Uh, see, uh, you just spoke about conforming. So I've always been a non-conformist, firstly. And uh, secondly, I, you know, uh, fond of breaking the rules and stuff. And uh, secondly, as far as uh, those kind of professions conforming to the gender, you're very correct. But then we should not forget, you know, that we come from a country where uh, we've had a history and a tradition of thousands of years uh, where women have been have been warriors and have been really uh, uh, have showcased their bravery in various fields and especially war you know right. uh, we can always count them uh, we've had this history and tradition about uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai, uh, Kitu yeah. Chanama you know there, there have been so many women warriors Absolutely. so firstly uh, I think we should just get rid of this myth that uh, women are particularly uh, meant for this profession or that profession so that can be laid aside. And uh, besides that, uh, women all over the world, you know, since both the world wars have shown that what they are uh, capable of, and uh, they've not only really flown fighters, they've been warriors. Uh, they've been, they've, uh, they've done all kinds of brave activities, as well as uh, broken glass ceilings as far as, far as the male dominated uh, professions and spaces have been con are concerned. Uh, like, for example, recently I came to know about this uh, first nuclear scientist, you know, uh, this lady, she was a Jewish lady and she never got her due. So a new book is coming up about her and I was really happy that all these years later, there's somebody who's chronicling her life and her uh, achievements. So th there are so many of them all around the world in all kinds of fields and mostly male dominated ones. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, we should uh, pay our homage to them and I completely salute them and respect them. So, I, and as far as my journey is concerned, um, I was always fond of uh, anything that's got to do with uh, the military, the armed forces, and because I grew up in a family of military yeah. men. 
and i was myself an instructor in the indian military academy so anything mm-hmm. concerned with defense came to me naturally and aerospace and fighter flying had a special place in my heart and as far as uh, overcoming challenges is concerned see firstly uh, defense journalism uh, is itself male dominated yes and secondly fighter flying is even more so correct so i don't blame my male colleagues you know when they uh, snide at me and you know j- take jibes and you know take pot shots mm. i don't blame them but then i also should not be blamed you know because i am one person who who's known for doing things that whatever you ask me not to do mm. so i have also taken those kind of uh, risks and challenges and i have overcome them quite successfully so uh, and as far as fighter flying is concerned uh, see some of my colleagues uh, they tried to really dissuade me discourage me but then i was pretty determined and i had a long wait of 2 years but then i just did it you know i first saw mr ratan tata flying in the year 2007 and that's when i decided that i'm also going to do it by then nobody had done it and there was absolutely nobody who was interested also so i i just thought that this is something i would like to do i went into the centrifugal chamber meant for fighter pilots in the command hospital of bangalore i tested myself for one hour and if you can come out you know without fainting without vomiting that means you're fit and which i was able to do and there were other male colleagues of mine who were testing and who were not able to sustain it even for 15 minutes then uh, i've had i've done some simulators on my laptop plus i i went to the us to visit the lockheed factory mm-hmm. and there also uh on the helicopter simulator i saw one of my male colleagues you know who was fa- who was feeling quite faintish and who was not able to stand there so that way physically physical fitness was one of the core requirements and it was extremely crucial and uh, i just got a go ahead you know after i was uh, 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 we underwent a medic- medical examination which was quite elaborate and uh, after the doctor gave me the green signal fit to fly then there was nothing stopping me i took the pre flight briefing which were very very elaborate and quite detailed mm-hmm. so i think uh, you know if you have the determination the passion and uh, the will and if and you know with slight preparation i think you can just do it and as far as my other personal preparation was concerned it was like you know one night before i i completely hydrated my body Hmm. and uh, eating a light breakfast and you know eating more of fruits and stuff like that so i did my personal preparation i spoke to some experienced veterans as to how to go about it and uh, my own personal uh, regime of yoga deep breathing jogging all those things which i've done since my childhood my elder brother who's an army officer he uh, put me into all this and i was quite happy and lucky that all those things helped me so that way uh, my personal preparation my determination and uh, and then i'm a believer in god so and luck and destiny so i think everything was just uh, put together yeah absolutely no this was an extreme feat that you achieved um, sumanji and you know it it goes beyond all expectations that the society has laid upon a woman honestly um so sumanji how important was a support system for you uh, you know in order to achieve these dreams you know support system in the form of friends family yeah. colleagues um how important was that for you see as far as family is concerned uh, they've always been very supportive in whatever i've always wanted to do mm-hmm. uh whether it's uh, entering a beauty pageant mm-hmm. you know so i've done those kind of things also i walked the ramp i've been a show stopper in lakme fashion week that's amazing so i did yeah. see that so, <laughs> i'll yeah, i'll send you so uh, those kind of thing i whatever i've always wanted to do in life whether it was anything you know i've been yeah. uh, given all that independence and freedom mm-hmm. to take my decisions and uh, everybody has backed me as far as my family is concerned they never stopped me from doing anything so uh, that's where the family stands and as far as uh, mm-hmm. friends were concerned uh, yeah. my, my closest friends you know uh, mm-hmm. who were my well wishers they were always with me they were happy for my achievements they were happy for what i was doing and uh, professional setup see uh, there you know they there uh, people are your adversaries in the sense that they are your competitors and they True. would very much like to do whatever you're doing you know hmm. so they may not be very uh, openly supportive or hmm. uh, kind of you know very happy 
uh, but then uh, that's okay i i didn't really care about anybody i just did whatever i wanted to and i was quite focused that's amazing that's good so so minji we have seen that you know the armed forces have come a long way from uh, you know 2009 till today in terms of giving women more opportunities to be inducted into the armed forces um however you know we have seen that the whatever decisions the government has taken it has not allowed women or it has not prompted or encouraged women to join the air force you know we've seen the dropout ratio to be extremely high in 2017 and 2018 where there were only about 56 or 59 women com- uh, women who were commissioned because there was such a high dropout rate from say 108 in 2016 so despite all these efforts put put in by the government and uh, you know having support systems in place why do you think women are still not able to join the armed forces or why do you think they are willing to leave it before completing their entire journey there uh see there could be many reasons for that you know i have myself cleared my ssb for a commission in the indian army as an officer two mm-hmm. times from bangalore 24 mm-hmm. board okay so uh, but i could not make it in the merits because uh, what women opt for plus the vacancy existing in that particular branch or department is what makes the merit you okay. may be absolutely fit because i'm uh, i was medically fit and i cleared mm-hmm. my ssb but then there is something called merit which is drawn later okay, okay. so for one particular seat you could have like 150 uh, girls you know who would qualify Okay. so it's a, it's a, it's a little tough because uh, women's ent- in the women's entry the seats are limited and uh, everything is against you know a particular branch it's not like male entry uh, where anybody who clears the ssb makes it because there's a shortage and then the uh, declassification of arms for uh, male officers is done later unlike okay. the women officers you know so uh, that is one of the thing but now since my time they've increased the seats firstly Okay. Secondly, uh, the rigor about selection of um, officers in the mm-hmm. armed forces is pretty much the same. The standards have not been lowered. So even if there are seats, but if people are not able to clear, then it's just too bad. You know, those seats will go empty. It's like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the armed forces, the military will not uh, lower the standard as far as selection for officers is concerned, which mm-hmm. is a great yeah. thing. Yeah, That's absolutely. That's how it should be. Absolutely. So that could be a reason, or maybe you know. Uh, Uh, women don't there are other things in which they might be interested there are other you know more promising careers in which they would like to go about uh, you know try their luck mm-hmm. or uh, the entry is so much that the seats are still less that could be a reason so i don't know exactly you know um, lately how is it how that has been as far as uh, combat is concerned Mm-hmm. uh see when i cleared my ssb uh, long back i was asked in the uh, conference as to okay. what is it that i would like to suggest to the mm-hmm. military so i this was one of my suggestions also that women should be allowed in combat so right. when uh, the supreme court gave came out with this order correct first for the navy and then subsequently for the other services um, yeah. because in the navy uh, they, are, they have been allowed on board warships so i right. took it as a personal victory and i was extremely happy for all the girls who are entering now that uh, firstly permanent commission and then combats right. but then i don't know how much you know as far as frontline combat is concerned would they be allowed because uh, even in the other countries you know uh, for example i had gone to spain for my euro fighter flight in 2017 and um, there i spent a full day with this f18 pilot natalia so okay. uh, she was a mother of a child and her husband also was a fighter pilot okay so i asked her what are the operational sorties she has done so she said that she has flown sorties in afghanistan but uh, she was never allowed to stay there you know she just took sorties okay. and then she was allowed and she was asked to come back to the nearest peaceful base whichever that was so i asked her why i mean you should have been there you know she said no it's not allowed so even in these advanced countries you know um, where there are women fighter pilots I don't think they are allowed uh, to go exactly at the front line and be there in the war zone. And more recently, last year we saw what happened with the uh, uh, wing commander Abhinandan. You know, he was taken POW. So I think these are the fears, you know, which are still there, very dominant and very prevalent in the psyche of the Indian uh, society and the military here. Mm-hmm. That if you allow women in front line combat, I mean, you cannot even imagine if there was a woman fighter pilot last year. 
doing what abhinandan did and then you know for 48 hours he was taken as prisoner of war so th- those kind of things are unimaginable so i think these fears you know i think uh, with time you know we'll overcome these fears things will change we are we are taking small steps but we'll be there that's my thinking right so you know talking about this decision that you know supreme court came up with you know it had a lot of backlash from the government which said a lot of things that you know women are not ready for permanent commission and uh, you know men are not ready to actually accept orders from women you know they're not mentally schooled um so this this statement is very worrying in itself i feel you know because this is this this does not talk about only about the no no i understand i'll tell you exactly what yeah. they mean you know uh see this is more applicable to the army okay. because they it's a yeah because it's about troops there a mm-hmm. woman is supposed to command troops okay right so and they are they are so used to you know because it's about the conditioning the, the societal conditioning that is given to our boys at home exactly and even otherwise so there um, uh, so the uh, it's about the army mm-hmm. that everybody stays together you know and the ceo is always there and then for a lady you know they would have to make special separate arrangements i mean those kind of things are still being worked out and those fears are still there as far as the navy and the air force is concerned they are more skill oriented unlike mm-hmm. the army which is more physically driven okay so um, those two services you know it's a little different and um, in the warships they already have women's cabins or you know most of them are, are being built in such a way Okay. so there i think uh, the absorption in the combat roles would be much easier and faster okay and it is being done it is so done. because because they do not have a you know a direct connection with the troops it's like that mm-hmm. and here in the army i think it will take time and uh, may not be you know in regimental service but somewhere you know they are trying to put them and place them because okay. sometime back i'd heard that um, in the command headquarters they were being given you know operational roles right so i think yeah i think they're trying to start something and uh, so slowly maybe it'll be there you know so what do you think are some of the changes that are required to so these are actually based on the attitudes of people or the mindsets of people this is not related to the ability uh, you know yeah. there will be women who will be physically at par with men to actually go on the front lines or you know take on the same responsibilities mm-hmm. so when we talk about that there is a this is a mindset issue here uh you know the society issue and um, attitude issue so what are some of the things that you know as a community as a society we should do in order to inculcate more you can say progressive thoughts so that tomorrow we don't you know hear these sort of thoughts in other fields see you're right you know uh, as far as uh, uh, changing the psyche of the uh, the mindset and the psyche of the society is concerned first it begins at home so we Absolutely. have to firstly inculcate in our boys that uh, everybody is equal hmm. and you're absolutely correct when you say that you know physically and uh, ability wise you know women are very much uh, at par with their male counterparts mm-hmm. in fact in some cases and places i've seen them even better correct correct yeah and so you're an example nothing... <laughs> <laughs> so there is absolutely nothing that they can't do exactly and uh, you know if given an opportunity they can even do it better absolutely you know, they, because i can't think of any uh, boxer world champion who's been like a champion five times but we have a mary kong no we, do. we don't have a male boxer who's been a champion world champion five times but mary kong has been so exactly. uh, there are so many things you know which they can do and they are able to do hmm. it's just about opportunity so we should create more opportunities more uh, vacancies and placements and uh, in when they are in school and college also you know yeah. instead of having like two different things based on gender i think you should just have one kind of standard but there is a slight problem here which i'd like to point out recently there was a story that uh, you know uh, women army officers were uh, fighting you know to bring down the physical standards as far as training is concerned there was a story like that right. you must have seen it yeah, yeah i don't understand you know why they should do something like that and in fact this existed even before you know when i was in the ima the bpt you know which is uh, compulsory for all the officers from time to time you know they have it like uh, it's battle physical efficiency test so uh, there uh, the standards were a little different between uh, for, for male and female officers and i used to always question even that time 
hmm. that why do you have it differently you know Absolutely. when she is an officer and drawing the same salary and has the same perks then she should undergo the same physical uh, uh, standards you know exactly uh, but then yeah but yeah. then i think they've had it right from the very beginning and uh, whoever made these rules you know they are archaic and they should just try to uh, change them and uh, women also should try to you know accordingly try to uh, inculcate all these standards and i'm sure they'll do it you know with time yeah. i think it will take some time but it'll be happen you know you're absolutely right because right after this ruling came out um, by the supreme mm-hmm. Gov- uh, by the supreme court there was an article which you know talked about that now when women will be eligible for permanent commission should the armed fo- or should the army reduce or should they uh, you know reduce the parameters or reduce the benchmarking that is required to qualify for a permanent commission so you know when we talk about equality you know equality means it you know it's it's at par with everything that means the standards by which a man is judged for a position should be the same which is applied to women you know the difference in standards of uh, you know qualifying which shouldn't be there because at the end of the day we have to understand that being on the front line is not about uh, you know who's getting an opportunity it's about who's physically fit to be there you know it's it's not it's a it's a very demanding no you you know you're right absolutely but then you know even before the training begins it starts right at the selection center because i have cleared it myself you know twice mm-hmm. and uh, there's an obstacle in the gto so i i asked them you know that uh, uh, should all these be done so they said that no for women it's nine obstacles for uh, male candidates it's 12 and okay. uh, you know some of them which they considered really difficult were left out for the women candidates so it it begins right from there you know i see and uh, we can't really blame uh, these people because it's about uh, the kind of society that has been hmm. how we are conditioned our kind our you know our training at home and uh, even at home and uh, you know when a girl falls sick and uh, it's always the mother who says that you know let her rest and uh, let the boys do it or whatever yeah, so yeah, yeah. so you know these little little things are always there a girl is always protected and she is always seen as you know somebody who has to be protected all the time so i think uh, it will take some time but absolutely but maybe. there are women like you you know who do not want this preferential treatment you know who want to be treated as a man is treated so definitely there are women like you you know who are running the change and who are bringing about this equality change and you know letting go of this preferential treatment so many places you know in the metro or wherever yeah. i travel and they just stand up you know see that so i tell them that no it's not required you can just keep sitting if i fight for equality then equality should be everywhere no why absolutely. should there be a separate queue for women absolutely absolutely so uh, even the women have to change a little you know in their They're thinking true. as you said we are conditioned in a certain way so that conditioning mm. starts at home and that needs to mm. change basically so sumanjay you've traveled uh, to so many countries you know you've you've been to america you've been to europe and you know you've met with the air force teams there you've worked with these teams do you see a difference in the attitudes of these teams towards their women colleagues the women surely yeah definitely and uh, yeah a lot of difference and uh, there i see more of equality and okay. uh, everybody is treated at par and i was on board uss nimitz okay that's the biggest uh, aircraft carrier of the us navy okay so uh, yeah during malabar exercise 3 years back exactly 3 years back in fact today i was just remembering <laughs> i got a certificate also by uh, mm-hmm. for a fly out on the c2 greyhound okay so uh, there you know i i was quite surprised because uh, uh, firstly on an aircraft carrier you had women and not just as officers you know that was the best part they were there as sailors and you know normal technic technicians as te- doing all kinds of work you know uh, they were manning uh, the engine room they were yeah. they were there in the um, room, uh, the media room you know which uh, which is completely technical in nature and then uh, there were uh, pilots also who were flying and then i uh, then into 2018 i visited the spanish ship also you know uh, right. juan carlos which came to bombay there also you know okay. i saw lady officers and i was quite impressed so uh, there you know in, i've seen in the psyche of uh, all these westerners in these western countries yes. that there is more of equality and an officers and officer irrespective of gender 
so that may not be the case uh, 100% but i but now i'm seeing that there is a lot of change in the indian armed forces also mm. and uh, uh, there is a lot of equality and you know uh, being at par right so maybe you know uh, so, yeah it will become 100% like the western countries and something yeah so but there is a change yeah. definitely definitely you know we have been seeing a lot of change mm. um so you know we talked about what the community can do to expedite this change what about some of the steps that the government can take at that level to one safeguard you know women's roles in the armed forces to expedite this change about you know having women respected and uh, you know treated at the same level as men are uh firstly i think the government needs to bring in safety for women Mm-hmm. because they you know they should firstly feel safe right. while going out for any kind of work and job only then will that you know uh, that kind of confidence will come in to right. to actually go and take on anything mm-hmm. so a little bit of women safety has to be increased i've seen that it has increased in uh, these past years but uh, maybe right. a little more and especially in certain states so because uh, as far as the rural belt is concerned mm-hmm. you know people are not still very comfortable sending their daughters for education and you know they Absolutely. they just think of a comfortable life that okay she is of a particular age and now she should be settled so that kind of thing should you know go away and there should be more confidence in people sending their daughters out to try out new things mm-hmm. so those kind of you know that kind of a, a mechanism should be built by the government and then uh, in schools and colleges i think there should be uh, equal number of opportunities for whatever they are doing you know whether it is sports or outdoor act- activities so uh, that kind of equal you know an equal uh, level playing field should be there for girls mm-hmm. and boys both whoever mm-hmm. wants to do whatever and in the armed forces they should increase seats and uh, you know have like if not equal but uh, a little you know a little increased um, number of seats for women in all kinds of branches and departments and uh, similarly um, i think they should open doors in almost every field you know as far yeah. as women are concerned because uh, only then will you get that imagination that this is also something that you can do correct right now you know if there is a firewall a woman can't really think and some day this has to happen so why not just start off and you never know you know you can get a really good uh, professional in a woman she could right. be much better than whoever is there now absolutely absolutely so you know the statistics that i have been reading you know it says that about 3% of the entire armed uh, army indian army has women uh, you know women recruits about i think the highest is in air force uh, about 13% to 14% of the total air force you know is women and about 6 to 7% in the navy so these numbers are not promising in itself right now uh, you mm-hmm. know while the air force is i would say as you also mentioned that it's a little more progressive in terms of accepting women and you know now they've also started uh, training women to become fighter pilots but uh, you know the navy again as well is following the footsteps of the air force but the army is still uh, you know at a at a low pacing uh which also you mentioned because you know it's a different ball game altogether yeah. um but but these numbers you know we we do hope to see an increase in these numbers in the coming times you know at least to a 20 to 30% of a ratio uh you know because that is that is a representation we are looking at because we we say that india has the world's largest army and the 3% of that army only consists of women it's it's a little dismal you're right you know as i has mentioned earlier army is more physically driven yeah so you know those kind of fears and then uh, being posted at borders and far flung areas i think that creates the fear and uh, air force and navy you know unlikely so they are more uh, skill oriented hmm. and by the way uh, we'll be happy to know that the navy is the first service which started um, women's entry in the sailors branch also Okay. so that is also one thing which has really given me a lot of happiness hmm. that uh, uh, you know even the non officer cadre has right. been uh, given to the uh, women who whoever oh. wants to be there so that is one very progressive move hmm. and uh, as far as the army is concerned you're right that it's the largest army 
but then women's entry is not there as much as it should be it should you know be, there's yeah. no parity yeah yeah so but then uh, uh, you know it's 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 the same you know because a large yeah. part of the army is the fighting arm correct correct whether it's correct. infantry or armor or artillery so those are not open Hmm. so once those doors are open i'm sure you know there will be parity and i do hope that this decision that has come out you know once we have the administration and the infra the structure in place there'll be more recruits because you know now women will be eligible yeah. for permanent commission and all the benefits that come with permanent commission so a lot of uh, women you know worry about this um, trade off between their careers and uh, you know family motherhood mm-hmm. uh you know husband families um in the armed forces you know any any force we take you know there's like a i think there's a period of say 14 years that you have to serve um you know so there's always this that you know will i be able to spend time with my family will i be able to give that uh will i be able to raise a family will i be able to give time to my husband take care of my mother father so you know a lot of times women are not able to balance their careers and their personal lives uh so do you, do you think a balance like this can be maintained by women and how do you think this balance can be brought about i think it can be maintained and uh, it's just about you know juggling like all, because women by nature and by birth are multitaskers mm. and uh, i have myself seen women you know do, because it's not ju- it's not just the military even yeah. outside whoever you know when they are doing their jobs and uh, career professionals in the private and corporate world yeah so they are maintaining a balance and they are juggling everything together you know whether it's home front or the office front so likewise you know similarly it can be done even in the military i'm sure it's possible because i have seen so many of my friends who were married mm-hmm. and who were army officers and they were pretty okay you know i mean okay. just, you just have to maintain a balance and uh, this lady also whom i spoke to you about in the spanish air force the f18 pilot mm-hmm. she was a mother and she was herself married to a fighter pilot so right. i asked her how does she ma- manage you know so she said that we take turns so today you yeah. know and she was uh, in a, a quite responsible position there you know she was the commander of the uh, mm. fighter ops okay so but uh, so she told me that they take turns you know and uh, when she is busy and you know she is going out for an operation mm. Uh, when she is doing a sorty you know outside the country or something right. so the husband maintains he manages the home front and you know he he looks after the son the little baby and uh, then she, she also had support from her extended family mm. so she says that that's how we manage and uh, there there has been no problem so i'm sure you know that way um uh, mm. the way uh, women are managing in other professions likewise even in the military you know it's, right. it's possible I think that's extremely important you know for everyone to understand that you know while a woman can multitask she does need a support system she mm. does need a supporting husband a supporting family, family. she has to you know achieve her dreams because otherwise mm. if you don't have that support which you know which is very uh, you know unfortunate to say that in india this support system a lot of women capable women do not have because mm. again you know the mindset or the conformity of the gender roles comes in um so you know they get scared they get uh, you know they get dismot- they get demotivated to actually follow those dreams so i think it's very important to have that support system in uh, today's world yeah no you're right you know a family support system a supporting yeah. husband without all those things you can't move ahead correct correct so sumanji you know what is some of, what is like your future advice you know for the young professionals today the women who are looking to achieve their dreams in whatever field you know because you have broken glass ceilings in in so many field you know in so many areas that uh, you know it's it's an inspiration to these women so what is the advice you would like to give these young professionals uh see uh, i don't know if i'm really qualified to advise people <laughs> of course yeah. uh, all i can say is that uh, see if you have a dream and if you're really passionate about something yeah so just go ahead and get it you know and uh, it'll happen it may take some time but uh, don't give it up for anything mm-hmm. and uh, just go about it with honesty and mm-hmm. hard work and it'll happen you know surely so uh, and there's nothing to be fearful about you know there's nothing in this world uh that you should be scared about and uh, and nothing is really impossible you know it may take some time it may appear difficult but if you're really honest and you're hard working 
uh, it'll happen that's that's amazing advice and i think you <laughs> once mentioned that it was your determination and sheer will power through which you you know achieved what you did what you achieved so i think that's extremely important for women as well as men you know to to actually focus on that one goal that they have set for themselves and achieve it through whatever means possible and not let anything deter them in their way no that's that's true so suman ji i have uh, you know finished with my questions that i had for you today and i am extremely thankful for you to be a part of nari talks and you shared some of the brilliant insights into the woman you are today and i hope i can become a woman like you tomorrow you know who's achieved such great heights and you know who's is inspired no. so many people <laughs> no don't say that in fact i admire you you know <laughs> and uh, yeah you you're, you're quite a successful and you're an achiever in your own right thank so, you so uh, don't try to be something else and everybody is an achiever you know a, a woman you know who's in a village and yeah. managing a large household and doing all this we can't do those absolutely. things absolutely so it's you know so uh, being in somebody's shoes i mean that that's not the right attitude everybody yeah. is an achiever in their own right and um, i think you know women by nature they yeah. can do so much absolutely and whoever is doing what in whichever area and whichever field i think we should just respect them absolutely and i totally respect anybody you know any woman who is hard working and who's managing her life well so and i totally respect you you're a thank young you. achiever thank you <laughs> so much and i wish you all the best you know and uh, i wish you achieve many more milestones in your life thank you thank you so much suman ji and thank you today thank you, thank you for today thank you so much